Well, welcome to our second week in our series, The Cure for the Seven Deadly Sins, because there are those things in all of our lives that we're looking for a cure for. At New Year's, we filled out these cards, these postcards, talking about and declaring our struggles that we had and our confessions to God without our names on them. Except for a few of you, Jason, Pierre, and it's kind of embarrassing that you didn't listen to your wives uh, because as we kind of took in the cards and we were reading through them, we noticed that some of you uh, forgot to uh, follow the instructions. And I know your wives are constantly telling you to follow the instructions, but because you didn't, your names were on them. And so we're going to use your sins as an illustration this morning. Uh, and I hope you don't mind. But uh, I figured since you put your name on them, they're public. And so uh, we posted them on the internet. And uh, we hope you don't mind. I'm just kidding. Um, nobody did that. <laughs> and we're glad. But uh, we found that as we grouped them together, there were seven neat little piles that uh, kind of fell into the things that have been known as the seven deadly sins. Now, the seven deadly sins are not something that's listed out in Scripture. There are seven things in Proverbs that um, God says that he doesn't like, but those aren't particularly the things that have become known as the seven deadly sins, and so these aren't particularly the seven deadly sins as God describes them, but these are seven things that are obviously things that mankind has struggled with throughout history, and in fact have just kind of become the things that we'd all say that we struggle with. So it was no surprise when we took in those cards at New Year's that the very things that humanity has struggled with since the beginning of time are the same things things that you and I are struggling with today. I know it's, it's shocking, but it's true. We are just like everybody else at times. And so I wanted to kind of walk through these seven. The first one was obviously, it's all about you. What sin would this be? It's all about you. How to take something in yourself. What is it? You can just shout it out. Pride, right. The first one that Richard covered in the first week, we started talking about pride. The second one of these seven sins is this. Why do today what you can do tomorrow? Steps to being a successful sloth. That's right. And Matt Treemster is going to be preaching on that next month in, uh, just because he struggles with it and wanted to share that all with us. And so he thought he would, uh, if you know Matt, you know that... Uh, Matt uh, is a little bit of the reverse of that, so. Sloth. How to get free porn. Something without getting caught. Lust. Boy, that one wasn't one people wanted to shout out, strangely enough. 28 ways, 28 ways to bottle up hate. How to keep anger a secret. Wrath. There we go. Losing weight while you eat. Your guide to guilt-free. I wish that was true. We're going to skip down to the last one because the next one is the one we're going to do this morning. Uh, a roadmap to a richer life. All the ways to get more wealth. Greed. Finally, this week's topic. Don't just keep up with the Joneses. Cause your friends to envy you. This is one of those sins that often goes undetected in our lives, doesn't it? But can you imagine this? Just picture this with me for a moment. If each one of these seven sins was represented by a different color, and we churned that color when we were struggling with that sin, how fun would that be? <laughs> I mean, you just churn the color of your sin and everybody's like, hey, wow. Because there are certain sins that we struggle with that are kind of obvious to everyone and there are other sins like this one, envy, that other people don't necessarily see as obviously. And so I would love it if everybody just churned the color of their sin. And it would just make it really simple to help me kind of counsel people and work through issues with people. And when people were kind of struggling with lying, it would be obvious to me and I'd be able to kind of help walk them through it. And That'd be helpful, you know, in our marriage, I'm sure, too, with Adrian and I. It'd be helpful with your kids, wouldn't it? If you were like, hey, this is what I need to help them with. But the reality is that's not true. But what would be the color, if you were going to churn a color with envy, what color would you churn? 
hey, you're a smart group. I, uh, I was kind of hoping that there would be at least one or two people other than Dave that got the right answer. <laughs> but I mean, if it was red, it would be wrath, right? I mean, the color red would make sense for wrath because we kind of boil up with anger and we turn red. If, uh, if our sin was... Um, I, I kind of thought if our sin was green or greed, it would be green rather than envy. I don't really understand why green is envy. If it was lust, maybe it'd be red too because of the red light district. Or sloth could be yellow because it's like they like to be slow and just kind of take their time through things. But why green with envy? Now, how many people are, how, you know, watch the TV show Cheers? You like the, a few of you, one or two of you? So Cliff Clavin, uh, Cliff Clavin fact. Okay, for all of you that get this, Cliff Clave, in fact, the, um, where green with envy came from is this. Um, in ancient Greek, in ancient Greece, they had a view that anybody that struggled with envy actually had an increase of bile in their system and that they would actually churn a greenish yellow. And so in ancient Greece, they actually believed True story, Cliff Clavin fact, that people would turn green with envy and that is where this whole idea of the kind of green monster kind of came from with envy. And so they actually believed that our skin color would turn green. And I'm serious, but I think that would be really helpful for all of us if that were, because this is one of those sins that just kind of hides out and doesn't really get found out very easily. James, the brother of Jesus, says that all sins, really, the battlefield starts in our minds where a thought comes into our mind and we're enticed by it. And we are slowly kind of dragged into it or pulled off into that sin because this idea begins to percolate in our head. And envy is one of those things where it doesn't necessarily come out, but it begins to percolate in our head and we begin to kind of be dragged off away into it and it migrates into our hearts and it goes something like this. I want a better car. I want what my neighbor has and maybe you are a person who saves and you've been saving up for that new car and you finally get that new car but just before you get it your neighbor gets the same car only the souped up version with the leather seats and the dual air conditioning and uh, the heated seats and they just get the the better version and you just kind of feel like I'm getting ripped off or you notice that your little sandcastle house isn't quite as nice as the guys down the street and you're like, I want that house. Or, uh, and this is a little awkward, I want her body, not mine. Um, and you, you hopefully know why that's awkward for me to say. <laughs> if you don't, then there's another sin we need to deal with. But I want a better job like so-and-so or so-and-so, whichever it is that you're wanting. Or um, I want a better spiritual life. I want to be like that person who has a red phone to God that when they pray, God answers because uh, I just, I want a better spiritual life. And then there's, um, I want talent like Sean or Shayla can sing. And I, I actually do envy that. That's that's quite obvious. I'd love to be a rock star and play guitar like Matt Brazot. I mean, he's amazing, and I'd love to have talent like that, but God hasn't given me that, and that's all right, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I don't just want that shirt. I want to wear it better than them. I mean, we all struggle with this in different ways, um, but let me just show you a video, because if you don't relate with any of this stuff, you're going to relate with this video in kind of that awkward kind of laughter. It, you are going to laugh, but it, it's going to be awkward. So let's, let's watch this. So Caroline read nearly an entire Dr. Seuss book this morning. I'm so proud of her. Oh, I remember when Delaney read Dr. Seuss. <laughs> She's beyond that? Oh, we're on to chapter books now. Although Dr. Seuss books are good. Did I say Dr. Seuss books? I meant a biography on Dr. Seuss. She read a biography? I don't want to brag. <laughs> Delaney would struggle with a biography in most languages. Mommy, is this a Pepsi? <laughs> it's a Coke. C O K E. Coke. We were both wrong.
It's a house Brian. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah. Work is just picking up and it's just really busy. Same with Paul. Even busier. How are they coming? Hey, Paul. How do you like your meat cooked? Well done. Well done? You sure you want meat? I could have Susan make you a salad. Oh, I meant done well. You know, not well done. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, medium, I guess. Medium. You gonna cook all the flavor out of it? Medium for Sarah. <laughs> I want mine medium rare. No, I want red. You know, if I could, I'd just slice the meat out of a live cow and then just warm it up with the space heater. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. Yeah, sometimes I don't even leave it on long enough to melt the cheese. Well, then, this one is perfect for you. You enjoy that, man. Susan, I have to apologize. No. Yes, I keep trying to one-up you on everything. The kids, the house, clothes. Clothes, come on. I do, it's awful. It's a bad habit. Well, I appreciate you admitting that. <laughs> I always see you as near perfect. Oh no, no. Truth be told, I'm a mess. Yeah, I mean, the kids are struggling in school, and I can't keep the house clean, and I eat a slice of cake, I gain three pounds. <laughs> you think that's bad? My daughter still doesn't know her sight words. I'm too embarrassed to have anyone in my kitchen, and I can't wait if I so much as smell sugar. I made cookies last week, I didn't eat them, I just touched them. Four pounds. I gained two pounds yesterday. Not that bad. Well on a fast. All of us do this. We are always looking to the left and to the right, comparing ourselves to other people. We're always wanting to be better than the people around us. And maybe some of you remember from our family values series last year, we talked about the, the fact that we live in the land of Ur. We want to be richer, skinnier, smarter, taller, prettier, happier, hipper, and more talented Ur. Right? I want to be more Ur than you. Like when we go out for lunch or we go out for a coffee, when we leave... I want to feel better about myself than I do about you. That is just the way it works in our culture, isn't it? That we want to feel better than the other people around us when we leave the conversation. And what is worse when it comes to our families with our husband or our wife, we want more errs for them too. We want more errs for our kids. We want more errs for our grandkids. We want our grandkids to be better. We want our own kids to be better. And so we push them and we kind of force them to become more err. And I, what's really sad is that often this gets so bad for people that they actually love it when other people's kids fail. And they actually take delight in the fact that somebody else's kid is messing up or not doing well. And it gets incredibly messed up when it's other Christians who are actually delighted in other people's kids messing up because it somehow makes you feel better about yourself. And I can tell you that for Adrian and I, we experience this all the time where people will actually come up to us and they'll be like, I'm so glad that Sparrow was screaming at you. <laughs> we're kind of like, what? And they're like, well, we just, you know, we thought you guys were perfect. And now that we know that your kids are as messed up as ours, we just feel better about ourselves. <laughs> and I'm like, wow. So like you're praying against my kids obeying God. <laughs> and somehow that makes you feel better about yourself. And yet people do that all the time. It's kind of strange that we would actually kind of not be delighting in what God's doing in one another's kids or in one another's lives, but we constantly do this, don't we? If we're honest with ourselves, if we're truly honest, it happens. It's embarrassing, but we live in the land of Ur. 
And last year in this message, I also said there's the other side of this, those people that we look down at that are heavier or they're a little, their son's a little slower or their daughter is a little shorter or they're a little poorer or nerdier or sadder. And so we can feel superior-er in these situations, can't we? And we know we shouldn't be feeling this way. We know we shouldn't be, but somehow there's something in us that wants to feel superior -er than others. And so when we look to the right and we feel superior, -er, we feel good. And when we look to the left and we feel inferior, -er, we feel bad about ourselves. And it isn't helping really at all, is it? I mean, when you think about it, we don't, I don't even have to tell you this morning that you're not winning anything because you're superior-er or inferior-er to this side or that, but there we are. That's just the reality that most of us find ourselves in. And there's some of you that are here this morning that are on the other side of this, and you aren't comparing yourself to other people anymore because you feel poorly about yourself, and you don't feel good enough about yourself that you're actually at a place that you can fill in the blank on this one where you will never be as blank as them. You will never have as much financial freedom as them. You will never have as good of a marriage as them. Your kids will never be as good at hockey as them or as good at football or, or soccer or whatever it is. And there's just something that you can fill in that blank in because you feel like your life is never going to measure up because when you look in the mirror, you don't feel very good about yourself. And regardless of which group you find yourself in, here's where I want to start today. Because if we don't get this as kind of the foundation for this, we're not going to be able to move to the place that God wants to take us to this morning. And this is kind of the small, big idea. This is the place where I want to start. And it's this concept this morning. Here's where I want us to begin. There is no win in comparison. There's no win in comparison. There's no finish line. There's no final sense of satisfaction. There's no win. If you feel better than someone else and you're doing better than them, that doesn't cause you to actually win anything. And if you're not feeling as good as someone else, it's not helping you. How does knowing either really benefit you? God doesn't call us to use everyone else as our measuring stick for success. In fact, Jesus tells us that when we're doing this, life becomes like a carnival mirror, really, is what he's saying. When we feel taller in front of some, and we feel smaller and insignificant in front of others, that we're missing out on what God sees in us and who God has created us to be. And we see this in his story of the parable of the talents where Jesus says to us that it doesn't matter what I've given to this person or entrusted to this person. What matters is what I've entrusted to you. What matters is what I've called you to do and who I made you to be. And that is what truly matters. Are you doing what you can with who I've made you to be and how, what I've given you and where I placed you? Are you doing the best with what you have? But so often we get caught up in thinking, hey, that person got 10 talents and that person got five talents and I got three talents and that person got one talent. And we're so focused on what everybody else got. We miss out on what God has given us and living thankful and content with what God is calling us to. Which leads us to the big idea of today. And that is this. Be content with how God made you, what God gave you, and where God put you. Then celebrate what God will do with you. The cure for envy is being content with what God has entrusted us with and using it for his glory. Before we enter into the scripture today, I just want to show one more little video that will get us into the mind frame of understanding this point. God's calling us to cultivate what he's given us and not what he's called everybody else to cultivate. Look past it and see God. See how he sees you. 
Let's take a look at the scripture this morning. In 1 Samuel 17, 17 to 40, if you have your Bibles and you want to open them with me this morning, you can. It's going to be up on the screen. But uh, you can follow along. This is a story where David first became famous. And David is one of those people in the Bible that... um, We tend to love because he started out as the smallest and most insignificant son of Jesse. He was the weakling. He was the one that everybody thought should be looked over as the one that God was choosing to anoint to be the king of Israel amongst his brothers. His brothers were stronger than him. They were better warriors. And and yet David was the one that was selected and chosen. And so we love this story because it's kind of that underdog story and we kind of see ourselves in it and we're kind of excited about David, this young, kind of scrawny, insignificant kind of person who is able to do great things. And so it kind of starts out with an unlikely hero. And what you need to know in this kind of scene uh, is that it is a scene where two opposing forces are coming together. Now, I watched Braveheart this week, so that's kind of on my mind. How many, how many men have seen Braveheart? How many ladies have seen Braveheart? Okay, so most people. So there's a scene in Braveheart where um, the Scottish come out and uh, they're kind of a small band of misfits and then the English army comes out with their uh, cattle, or cattle, their horses and there's like, (laughs) that that really wouldn't be intimidating, would it? (laughs) They're riding out on the cow. Uh, Come on, Betsy. Uh, anyway, so they so they come out on the cat. Uh, the, <laughs> they come out on the horse, and uh, they're kind of feeling intimidated. The Scottish are because there's this incredible um, force of the English. They outnumber them at least three to one. And William Wallace comes out. I, I wish I could do the Scottish accent, but I can't, so I, I won't. But he comes out, and he's all dressed in war paint, and he's ready to to pick a fight. And he stirs up something in the Scottish to believe that they can win the battle. Whereas before that, they were all incredibly intimidated by the English. Because of everything that they saw on the other side. And so there's, this is the kind of scene that was going on here. The Israelites are on one side and they're kind of this small ragtag group of Israelites that are following God and trying to do the right things. And they're, so they're representing their God on this side and they kind of want freedom and they want the right things. And then there's the Philistines on the other side who have the Amalekites with them. Now, for those of you that don't know, Richard, could you stand on your chair just for a second? The Amalekites were taller than this. They were 9 to 11 feet tall. Goliath was an Amalekite. And so they had these, thanks Richard, they had this incredibly large army against the smaller, insignificant Israelites. And so they're feeling a little intimidated by what's going on. And David has been kind of left at home to take care of the sheep. But while they're standing there, the His father, Jesse, says to David, look, David, your brothers have been gone a long time. They haven't eaten. Here, take some food to them and go and speak to your brothers. But there's this scene going on. And so we see in the passage, it starts here, Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of supplies, meaning that he brought the food over from his father, Jesse, to leave there and asked his brothers how they were. So he went up to check as his father had asked him to in the verses prior to this. And while he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, so he's somewhere between 9 and 11 feet tall, huge, ripped, this is a mammoth man, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. It was making fun of the Israelites and their God, challenging any man in that room, in that room, in that battlefield, any man to come forward and fight Goliath one-on-one. And if he can defeat Goliath one-on-one in battle, all of the Philistines will serve the Israelites and worship their God. But if Goliath can defeat the one Israelite that will come out, then all the Israelites will have to stop worshiping God and serve the Philistines. And so he comes out and he knows that this really is a is a battle that he's going to win and he's mocking them and kind of making fun of them. And the Israelites do what we would expect. Whenever the Israelites saw the man, 
They all fled from him in great fear. The Israelites fell into the comparison trap. They looked at themselves and they said, this is a battle we're not going to win. This is Goliath against the small, insignificant Israelite who can just kind of put his hand on top of my head and beat me senseless. He can, it's like the Hulk kind of slapping uh, the enemy around. Now, David isn't doing this. He's not focused on comparing himself to Goliath. David is not focused on the giant problem. He's focused on his giant God. He's looking past the problem to the one who brings the solution. It didn't matter what he said about their God. David was looking past it. David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? He just has a completely different take on it. See, David doesn't think it's a fair battle either. Only he sees God as the giant and Goliath as the small, insignificant speck that's going to get wiped off the face of the planet. It's just a totally different way of looking at it. The Israelites fall into a comparison trap. They feel like, hey, I'm too small and insignificant. I can't possibly face this problem on my own. I can't possibly deal with this. I, I'm not big enough. I'm not strong enough. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough talent. I don't have enough education. I don't have enough whatever it is that you feel like you don't have enough of. That's how they were feeling. And they were seeing this giant issue in front of themselves and they're thinking, I just can't do this. But David saw it from the reverse perspective. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger and he asked him, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those sheep in the wilderness? In other words, hey, look, kid, you're supposed to be back with the sheep, tending the sheep. What do you think you're doing stirring all this up? Who do you think you are, David? He says, I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. He's like making fun of his brother because he's worried that his brother's going to show him up. He's making fun of him, kind of like kids on a school ground to try and get the other kids to realize, the other people to realize that David is not that significant. I mean, my brother isn't going to show me up, is kind of his attitude. Now, David says, now what have I done? Can I even speak? He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter and the men answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, the king. And Saul sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you're not able to go against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man and he's been a warrior from his youth. Not to mention that he's got at least three to five feet on you and he's going to squish you. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came up and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by the hair. I struck it. And killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. Because he has defiled the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion. And the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hands of this Philistine. See God had proven himself to David. David knew God was capable. What God was capable of through him. He wasn't envious of Goliath's stature. He was content with who God had made him to be. And he was willing to use what God had given him for God's glory. Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. And then there was this final test for David. It wasn't like he hadn't already passed all the other tests. He wasn't envious of Goliath like the others. He wasn't allowing his brother's envy to distract him from what God was calling him to. But there was a third test and it's in these verses. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. This is the king dressing this young man. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. And how often do we do this? 
Where someone else comes along and we're like, if I just had their talent, if I just had their armor, if I just had their resources, if I just had their house, if I just had their family, if I just had their kids, if I just had their spouse, if I just had, if I just had that, then my life would be better. Everything would be okay. It would all be set for me. I wouldn't have to worry about anything anymore if I just had what they have. If God had have just made me like them, if God had have just given me what God gave them, if God had have just put me in the position that God chose to give them, then everything would be okay. But David makes a different choice here. He decides not to wear Saul's armor. He decides to be David in the battle. He decides that despite the fact that he'll go in unarmed, because that's what he's used to. That is what David's going to do. David isn't going to wear Saul's armor. David is going to be who God made David to be. God calls us to be content with who we are in him, with the gifts and abilities he's given us, and to trust that is enough for God's purposes in our life. So David said, I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of a shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. And this is where history was made. Where David took down Goliath. David was content with who God had made David to be. What God had given David, and where God had placed David. David had learned to fight lions and bears with just the sling and some smooth stones. And now in the midst of the biggest battle of his life, David had a choice to make. Will I be who God's called me to be? Or will I try and be someone else? David was content with God and God's choices for him. And that is what God is calling us to as well. We all love these stories of the small underdog winning the day because we hope to see ourselves in them. But before we're going to be called to slay any giants, we have to be content with how God made you, what God gave you, and where God put you. Then celebrate what God will do with you. See, when you focus on God rather than yourself, you're able to see how God made you. You're able to see what God gave you and where God put you, and then you can celebrate what God is going to do with you in the midst of it. Stop the comparison strap. Stop envying everyone else around you. Be thankful. Be thankful for who God made you, what God gave you, and where God put you. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for who you made me to be. For what you've given me. Where you've placed me. God, I'm thankful for it all. And God, globally speaking, what you've given me is more than you've given most of the world. Where you've placed me is better than what most of the world gets to experience. The gifts and talents that you've given me, Lord, I know To whom much is given, much is expected. And so, Father, we come before you this morning with a thankful heart for what you've given us. And when you help us to stop looking to the left and to the right, but to see you in the midst of it all, and to allow you to see ourselves the way you see us. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, as usual, we're going to open the floor for questions, and you can ask me anything you want on the subject of today. Questions people have this morning.
Worship team, why don't you uh, come up? We'll just close off with a song this morning. Obviously, people's hearts are heavy on this. and Why don't you sing, sing uh, Holy Spirit Rain Down? When we stand, we'll just sing this song in closing. Let it be our benediction this morning.